light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me. as we come to the close of the year we've been looking at these works of the flesh and fruits of the Spirit, and I'm not sure that we'll, we covered all of them, and we may not even finish tonight's lesson uh, in, in time tonight. We may uh, just do one aspect of it so that we can let it all soak in, but uh, we want to make sure that we understand what we're doing with these things. We know that we suffer with the works of the flesh. We suffer with these things that we deal with, that there are desires that we have. And as they're listed there, as Paul lists them, he says that those who do such things, as I've told you before, I tell you now again, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why there's a warning against them. That's why he lists them for us to let us know that there's, there's this strict warning against these things, not to do these things, so that by not doing these things, we can subtract them from our life and fill those gaps, fill those holes well, those fruits of the Spirit that we've looked at. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. That self-control is probably the most difficult one that we have. And as we come to the one tonight that we're going to look at that's listed there in Galatians chapter 5 is drunkenness. That's one of those iffy topics that a lot of people, a lot of preachers don't want to talk about. And the reason why, it's not because we don't, and for myself, it's not because I don't have a belief about it, I don't have a faith about it, and, and what the Scripture says, I don't trust in the Scriptures enough, but it's really about, I know that a lot of people struggle with this. I know that a lot of good people struggle with this. And I know that a lot of people like to dabble in this. They like to partake a little bit here or there of things, as long as we're not drunken, right? That's, that's what this verse says, at least. So I think it's value for us to look at. And I want to just give you a few things as, as we start off. You might think that with the elevation of crack, marijuana, and the abuse of prescription drugs, and all that that is considered illegal activity, and rightly so it is, but the number one drug problem that we have in this world is a legal drug. There's more problems, more deaths that alcohol is responsible for than any other. 55% of all highway deaths are alcohol related. It's also related to liver problems, heart problems, more addictions. There are over 17 million alcoholics in our country. And rising. That's more than all of the other countries. That's a serious problem. It produces more death than any other drug, and it brings about more misery than any other. And it's legal. You would think if, if we had those numbers, you would think that when you, when you hear those numbers, you would think, well... You know, that's something that we shouldn't touch. That's something that's out there that we shouldn't have anything to do with, that we wouldn't want to, to dabble in at all because it's responsible for all those things. But it's just as easy to get our hands on that as it is milk and eggs at the grocery store. It's just as easy to throw that in our cart and, and, and to go shopping and to buy that at, at grocery stores, at gas stations. $25 billion will be spent this year on advertising alcohol. They'll spend $600 million on telling you what you should drink. Now, I didn't know this. I, I thought this. I thought that I used to not see all these hard liquor commercials on television. But before 2002, you, they weren't allowed to advertise hard liquor on television. After 2000, January 1, 2002, they passed a law that said now you can not only see beer commercials, but now you can see those hard liquor commercials. 
in those ads on television, which when those were placed, which, I, I, and I think you'll agree, it's all money for those things, those ads to be placed. Problems in the deaths, problems in the addiction, all went on the increase after that. And there's so many, tell, so many people telling us so many things about alcohol. So many people telling us so many different things that we need to make sure we understand what, what the Scripture says. We need to make sure we understand what the Bible says about it. Because the Bible does answer the question. You can go to the next screen. The Bible does answer that question. Is should Christians drink alcohol? It answers the question really Pretty straightforward for us. Well, what happens to us is we sometimes read what we want to read, you know? We see what we want to see. And we want to believe that it is acceptable for us to do some of these things. On the side, just a little bit. Everything in moderation, right? Well, if I told you I was using crack in moderation... You wouldn't think the same thing about everything in moderation, would you? We hold different standards for people as well. If you were to see me out drinking alcohol, if you were to walk through uh, a, a restaurant and you were to see Lee and I enjoying uh, uh, an alcoholic beverage at a restaurant, what would you think? What would you think if you saw us partaking in that? If you would think, well, you shouldn't do it because you're a minister. You're a preacher. You have an image. Well, according to the Scriptures, we're all ministers. We're all priests, remember? We've looked at that before. So I think we hold extra standards for each other that we shouldn't hold. So for us to look at this and see... What does the Bible say about Christian alcohol? How should we use it? And what about, is there a difference between hard liquor and beer and wine? I mean, don't we look at it as though those two categories, right? We look at it as wine, beer, and then you've got the whiskey, the bourbon, and the vodka, and those types of things. Well, I think the Bible deals with all that, and I think we'll see... And we may only do the first part, of, we may only do the definitions. Because I think when we see just the definitions of the words that are used, it might change the view a lot of people have. I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I don't want to make it out like Matt is telling you this. Because I, I, I don't want it to be that way. I want to look at these. And quite honestly... I've been dreading this one. I've been dreading this one, and this should be one of the easy ones. But I've dreaded this one. Because I know so many people have so many different views. And right now, usually my mouth doesn't get dry, but my mouth gets dry when I'm nervous. It's dry right now. So I want to talk to you, you know, from the heart and with the Word, and let's see what the Bible says about it. And you make your own judgment call with this. And you let that, you let your heart decide based on the Word, just as you would with anything else. And I think you'll see. The Bible defines these words. Because after all, we confuse it. We say, whoa, well, whoa, well, well, you know, it's, it's got to be okay somewhat because Jesus made wine, right? John chapter 2, Jesus made wine. Why would he make something and endorse other people drinking it if it was wrong? Well, that's how these definitions are going to see. Let's look in the Hebrew first. The first word that we'll look at here is uh, shikar. And, but before we read this, I want to read to you one of, the words, one of the times this is mentioned here and how the Bible describes it. Look at Proverbs 23, verse 31. L listen to what this says. Proverbs 23, verse 31. Please look at these verses. Don't take my word for it. Listen to what they say. Do not look on the wine 
when it is red. When it sparkles in the cup. When it goes down smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. And you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea, or one who lies down on the top of a mass. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. That sounds like somebody drunk, doesn't it? It sounds like somebody that's been drinking a lot, because when they drink a lot, their minds utters perverse things. And they're like someone who just goes and lies down in the middle of water. Someone who just lies down in the middle of nowhere. And and then you can hit them, you can beat them, and and they wake up and they don't know that you've done it. And when they do wake up, what is the first thing they think of? I think I'll have another. The word used here in this specific instance is the word up on the screen there is shakar. And it means that which intoxicates. And it's almost always translated as, and I think almost always, uh, almost always condemned, with one exception. And that's when it's used as a narcotic. Now, a narcotic seems like a strange word for us to use as thing that would be a good thing. But that narcotic would be used when someone is in severe pain. Or someone that would be in, in Bible times, that would be under a lot of distress. I want to stress that, not stress. There's a big difference between stress and distress. All right? And I think you'll agree with me. Look at this passage here, and you'll see. In Proverbs 31, verses 3 through 4. And we'll, we'll use Proverbs 31 a great deal. Proverbs 31, 3 through 7. Do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. Lest they drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of the afflicted. So right there in those two verses it says... It's good for high officials, the kings, the rulers. It's good for them not to seek that strong drink. You know, and we think that's where those people do, and it's accepted in the social circles, in people of high authority. It's okay for them, that we might assume, because that's just what happens. Well, no, the Bible says that those people in high places of authority, you shouldn't drink at all. You shouldn't desire that, because you won't be on your A-game with it. You'll forget what is decreed. You'll forget what laws you made or what laws you passed. And those types of things. But then listen to what it says here in that next verse. He says, Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. That means the bitter and the one who's perishing, that means someone who is very ill, someone whose life is almost over and they're in pain. We might define it as somebody that is in a lot of pain. Maybe they've got cancer, you know, and I always hear pancreatic cancer is a very, very painful cancer to have. And you think of that being someone being in a great deal of pain and they are to partake of that, give that to them so that when they're in pain, the pain will be eased. And not only that, they'll, they'll listen to what it says. Let him drink and forget his poverty or his problem and remember his trouble no more. And that's not in distress. That's not in stress. It's not in, just because I'm stressful, I got all these problems and I want to forget them. No, the Bible tells us we have to deal with our problems. We have to deal with our issues that we have. But if we're in something that we can't control and we're in a great deal of pain, yes, that would be acceptable for us to do that. But church, we have medications for that now. We have morphine for that now that people use when someone is dying. For instance, Miss Shannon, when she was passing away, I don't think her family would mind me using this as an example. When she was getting weaker and weaker, 
and getting worse and worse, they increased the morphine intake so that she would not feel the pain. That's the same situation. Wine shouldn't be given to drink. Strong drink shouldn't be given to those that drink and high officials. Give wine, this strong drink, to the person who is in a great deal of pain physically so that they'll be able to forget about the pain and not have to deal with that. That whereas would be normally unbearable. The second Hebrew word, that, that's one, almost always, trans, almost always condemned. The only time it's not condemned is when it is used for medicinal purposes. That word that's translated there. And you can look these up on your own. These are not my definitions. These are the definitions that the Bible gives and the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries. Look, the second one. The second one is tirosh. And it's translated as wine or new wine. Now, here's where it gets a little difficult for us to see. If you asked me what I had to drink for lunch, what'd you drink for lunch? And I said, well, I had a Coke. Well, in this part of the world, what does that mean? Does that mean I had a Coca-Cola? Doesn't have to, does it? I mean, we use the word Coke to go for Pepsi. We use the word Coke to go for Sprite. We use the word Coke to go for any, just virtually any carbonated drink is what we do, right? We say, I want Coke. Give me a Coke. Give me a Coke. Or a soda. Some of you may use that if you're from a different part of the country. Give me a soda. Cola. Something like that. Bill, that's what Bill would say, right? Seltzer water. <laughs> so we, when we look at with this, when we look at the word here as it's used, this uh, it's translated as, as wine, alcohol, and fermented wine or new wine. New wine is not considered alcoholic. New wine can be considered unfermented wine. All right? Always has a reference to non-intoxicating or grape juice. This is, this is where it's used here. This word is always used as wine or new wine. And it's referring to just simply unfermented. Okay? Just simply unfermented. Because the next few words, you're going to have to use both words you're going to have each word to, you, to mean both things. You've got to depend on the context. So this virtually means grape juice. And the reason why you look at this verse here, look at Isaiah 65, verse 8. And this is one of those times that it's used. And this is how you know it's used as grape juice. Because in Isaiah 65, verse 8, this is what it reads. Thus says the Lord, As new wine is found in the cluster... And one says, do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it. So I act on behalf of my spirits in order not to destroy all of them. New wine is found in the cluster. You don't look at a cluster of grapes on the vine and say, man, alcoholic right there. That's intoxicating. You look at that as fresh grape juice, and that's what it is. But the word is used as wine. It's translated just as wine. But it refers to the specific Hebrew word, would be translated for us as grape juice. Okay? So that's this one, tirosh. The next word, yayin. And this is where it gets a little hard for us to determine just on the definition. We have to look at the context. Yayin, this is the Hebrew word translated as fermented or unfermented, depending on the context. And here's how we'll see. Let's look while we're in Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 16, verse 10. Isaiah 16, verse 10. I didn't put these on the screen because I wanted you to turn to them yourself so you can see them in your own Bible. Gladness and joy are taken away from the fruitful field. In the vineyards also there will be no cries of joy or jubilant shouting. No treader treads out wine in the presses, for I, have, for I have made the shouting to cease. Well, if you were reading this, and you know the, the Hebrew word here is yayin, how would you translate that? Is fermented or unfermented? Well, let's look at it again. 
If they are taking this wine, this yayin, and they are treading it out in the presses. Wine goes through a fermentation process, right? If you take the grapes, you pluck them, you lay them down in the press, you press them, that makes grape juice. It takes a while for the fermentation process to begin. So this would refer to unfermented. <clears throat> the yay in here means unfermented wine because it's referring to those grapes that have been taken off the cluster, that have been placed in the press, that have been trodden out in the, grape, in the, in the wine press for them to make the juice that will later ferment to some extent, yes, but for them to use. So, in this case, yayin translates as unfermented wine. But then you look here in Proverbs chapter 20, and I think you all know this passage. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Proverbs 20, verse 1. One. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. <clears throat> and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. So when you see yay in there mentioned as wine, it translates there as wine. When you see that, you know it's not grape juice there. Because it's defined there in the context as a strong drink. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawl. Strong drink is a brawl means it's going to provoke you to fight. That's why, you have, that's why there is a term called bar fights. Okay? You don't have, you don't have sonic fights. Okay? You, you don't have Burger King fights. There, there's no term that describes... Trowbridge's fights, okay? They're bar fights for a reason. Because when people are intoxicated, they're a brawler. Okay? When you look at that, and wine is a mocker. What, what does it mean, a mocker? Well, if you're mocking someone, you're making fun of them. You, you've all seen those video clips of police officers who pull over a drunk driver and how ridiculous they look. Some of the things, that, the stunts that they pull and how drunk they are, how, how funny it is. Yes, it's funny. It's sad. But we can make fun, we make fun because they look ridiculous. People make fun of them. If you want to be made fun of, then yeah, partake of that. If you want to fight, partake of that. Because he says, wine is a mocker. It's an alcoholic content there. The strong drink is right here. It's intoxicating and there's a warning against partaking of it. But in the New Testament, we have a fourth word. Oinos. This is the fourth word here. Oinos. And it's also, just like the yayin, translated as fermented or unfermented, depending on the context. It's, it's, you have to look at the context to determine whether or not it is used as fermented or unfermented. And look at this one. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23 reads this. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. Here, it would be used as fermented wine, but it's also described for them to drink, not for the purpose of joy, not for the purpose of socially, but to drink for the purpose, to drink this wine for medicinal purposes. Now, church, we've come a long way in medicine. You know, and I, there, there would be no reason for me to drink a little wine for the stomach's sake because we have Rolaids, Tums. We have all of these other medications that we can take. We have all of these other things that, that we've been able to produce and some of these things that we do take. We do take alcohol for medication, do we not? I understand that. You know, when I, when I get sick with the cough medicine and all of that stuff, when you can't sleep at night, when you can't breathe, some of that stuff, the codeine, there, there's alcohol content in that. The NyQuil. There's alcoholic content. Those are things that are taken 
for the purpose of getting better. A lot of those are prescribed by your doctor to get well. That's, there's a reason for that. But if I told you that I drink NyQuil on a daily basis, you would look at it and say, well, he's not taking it because he can't breathe or he's coughing. There's a reason for taking it, and that is for the medicinal purposes. A little wine for the stomach's sake, he's mentioned. And the water that they drink, we could go into all that. We don't have time to go into all this, but the water that they would be drinking, some of the water's contaminated where they're drinking, and they're having to drink a little, a little of this acidity there to kill some of the bacteria as they would drink it so they wouldn't get sick, so they wouldn't get uh, some sort of virus from the water. It would be like us going down... Uh, to a third world country and taking a, a drink of the water there. Our stomach wouldn't be able to handle it because of the bacteria that's in the water. You take a little wine for the stomach's sake that it's mentioned here. But this is also the same word. Now, here's where we need to use common sense. Here he says to use it for this. He uses the same word in a few verses before, a few chapters before, in the qualifications for elders and deacons when he says, not addicted to wine, not given to wine, not given to much wine, which really is virtually the same as not being a given to, not taking of wine. It's just worded a little bit different there in the Greek. Why would he say it's okay to take it on a regular basis and then tell you not to take it at all? That one exception is there for medical reasons that he gives it to you. These are the words, these are the definitions that we've got here. So when you look at, when you go back to Proverbs 23, and going back to there for just a second, let's look at this. Proverbs 23, as we get, we'll close up shop right here on this one. Proverbs 23. When the, don't look on the wine, verse 31. When it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. What's he talking about here? This is the picture of fermentation. This is the picture of wine being fermented. Wine being intoxicating. So that goes back to the question, if, if the only time you look at wine being used in the Scriptures as endorsed is for medication purposes, if that is the only time it is used for med medical purposes, uh, for the stomach's sake, for those that are in distress, if that is the only time it's used there, then you have to look at John chapter 2 when Jesus makes the wine, when he turns the water into the wine, and the yayin word is used there, then you have to look at that and say, if God speaks against wine on every given occasion in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, why would Jesus make wine that would be alcoholic for those people to have a huge party to get drunk with? Is Jesus having an argument with the Father? Is Jesus saying, God, I know you said that is wrong, that it's a mocker, and that it's raging, but I'm going to tell you these people can control themselves. They can handle it. No. no. If you'll also look at that John chapter 2 passage, you'll notice what, the say, what they said about the wine. It's not that they just made the water to wine, or that he made the water to wine. What did, what did the head waiter say about the wine? It was the best wine. The best wine. You can look there in John 2, that's what it says. Most people serve the good wine first. And then when that runs out, they have to serve the old stuff. But you've served the best wine last. You've saved the best for last. So people that were there, they didn't care about a bitter taste of wine. They care, they care about the sweet taste of wine. When Jesus turned water to wine, he made that into grape juice. Fresh grape juice, or somewhat fresh grape juice, that was sweet. That if it was intoxicating, had very little intoxicating value, I believe. Because if it was intoxicating, then we have to reevaluate who Jesus is, his deity, what he stood for. Was he the Messiah? Did he really die on the cross? Because he's contradicting if he makes alcoholic wine for people to drink freely 
everything that his father taught before that. And that doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? So if we put our head on straight and we use common sense, it begins to make sense, doesn't it? And and even the wine that they did drink, even when it was intoxicating, even when they did drink wine, the the medicinal purposes, they had, it, it was watered down a good bit. It's nowhere near like the wine we drink today or that people drink today. It's nowhere near like the strong drink of the vodka or, or beer. It's, it's, not, it's not those things at all. I, I tell my students in Bible class when we get to John chapter 2 that if you want to drink, and they don't understand what wine is. They don't understand what, the, what it is. So I tell them, if you want to drink the way the Bible had wine to drink, then that's fine. You go buy you a bottle of Welch's, at the gas station, you open up, you take a swig, you go set it out under a tree outside on the track somewhere, and grapes come in in August, so you go get it in August. Go buy this in August. Turn it up, drink your swig up, put the lid back on, set it there under a tree and in the shade somewhere, and you go back in July and drink it. You know what they say? Oh, no, I wouldn't want to do that. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's old grape juice. And wine only came in once a year in August, and they had to gather it up, and they had to use it, and it had to last them the entire year until the grapes came in again. And yes, did some of it have alcoholic content to it? Yes, but they watered it down immensely to lower that alcoholic content. The good people, those people that didn't care, yeah, they took freely of it. They took freely of it, and they got intoxicated, and they made fools of themselves. And that was the reason why God warns against it in Proverbs chapter 20, and in Proverbs chapter 23, Proverbs chapter 31, over and over and over again. So many people within the church, so many people within the church, we have it in our fridge, And I'm going to say we, I don't. But you understand where I'm coming from this. We have it in our fridge. We have it in our cabinets. We partake of it on our vacations. On special trips. Special occasions. Maybe when no one else is around, where no one else can see us do it. And we rationalize in our own mind that we can do this socially because everybody else is doing it. Well, church, I'm going to tell you what my mom and dad used to tell me and what my youth minister told me, what my preacher told me, what my coach told me over and over again. That if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do it? No. Just because others are doing it doesn't make it right. Christians are commanded to be different. Listen, if it hurts your feelings, I'm sorry. If I've if I bothered you, if I made you feel uncomfortable, I'm sorry. But I, think I'm, I think I'm preaching the truth. I think I'm showing you what the Scripture says. That Christians really, we don't have any business around alcohol. Because what it does is it confuses our young children. It confuses them. It sends the wrong message. Not only that, but we subject ourselves to losing control. And I think we'd all agree that one thing we have the biggest problem with is self-control. I don't, I don't drink alcohol. You know why? Because Mary Jo made fudge. And I can't stop eating fudge. And if I can't stop eating fudge, I don't think I'd be able to stop drinking it. So I don't partake. And I think that's Even if it is mine, I think it's pretty good advice. It's not one of these lessons that people respond to because I don't want people to look at them thinking they've been doing it. But you know as well as I do that the gospel call is always open, the invitation is always open. And if there's something in your life, whether it's this or something else, that's amiss. You need to make it right. You need to make it right if it's private, between you and God. If it's between you and your family, you and your family. But if it's a public nature that people know about and are aware of, you need to make it right between you and God so that everyone could hear it. 
and change. And you can do that tonight by receiving the forgiveness of sins again, the precious blood of Jesus. We hold no grudges. We are not going to show any judgments. We are all human beings. We all sin. We all come short of the glory of God. This may be your weakness. My weakness is other things. We all have various weaknesses, so we're not going to be judgmental on anything. We're going to ask what you did. doesn't matter what you did, because we're all sinners, and a sin is a sin is a sin. But when it comes to something like this, I think it's something that we need to be aware of, and it's something we need to steer away from. There's a whole other part of this lesson I could go through, but I think I'll hold off on that to another time, about what all it does to our bodies, what all it does to our social lives, what all it does to our families, how it destroys all these other aspects. But I've already used way too much of my time tonight. So look at your life. And if there's something amiss that you need to fix, the blood of Jesus is here for you to receive that forgiveness as we stand and sing the invitation song. Shine, Jesus, shine.